This is the true story of Alexis Sharkey, an incredibly driven, popular and intelligent young influencer, someone that had a life full of money, beaches and good times ahead of her. So when she mysteriously stopped replying to messages and witness stories weren't quite adding up, where would her friends, family and the police even begin to look? What had become of Alexis? Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved Alexis and all those affected by this case. Alexis Robinault was born in Warren, Pennsylvania on January the 25th, 1994. Even as a child, she could light up her room with her smile. When she laughed, she had a way of making everyone feel like they were in on the joke. Despite growing up in a small town, everyone knew that Alexis was always destined for bigger things. She wanted to travel, see the world and experience new things. She always talked about getting out of that small town. After graduating from high school, Alexis went on to study biology and psychology at the University of Pittsburgh. She was considering going to medical school, but she was apprehensive. By going to medical school, starting her career and planting her roots in one area, she worried she could be settling down for life. After graduating, she decided to spend the next few years checking things off of her bucket list. She carefully curated her Instagram feed to showcase her adventures. She gained a lot of attention and fell into becoming an influencer. She moved to Texas and worked as a bartender at Twin Peaks. This was to support herself while she traveled and explored new places. Here she met her future husband, Tom Sharkey. 23 years her senior, the two had immediate chemistry. Tom worked as a consultant in the oil field and he would often travel travel around the country for work, but whenever he was in Odessa, he would stop into the Twin Peaks to see Alexis. He seemed like a nice guy and the two hit it off. Alexis and Tom got married in 2019 and eventually moved to Houston, Texas. Tom had friends in the area, but Alexis hardly knew anyone. She worked from home as an influencer, so she downloaded Bumble as a way to meet new friends. Through the app, she met Tanya Ricardo and they hit it off immediately. Tanya introduced Alexis to her group of friends and within just a couple of weeks, Alexis had formed another close-knit circle of friends. She took her friendship seriously and always made it a point to spend time with people outside of her relationships. Thanksgiving 2020 was no different. Alexis spent Thanksgiving with Tanya and her family away from Tom. They played board games and ate all day with everyone in high spirits. Then at around midnight, another friend picked up Alexis and they went out to a bar. They parted the night or the morning away until 3am. Alexis then returned to Tanya's house to pick up her car and drive back to her apartment. The next day was Black Friday and as an influencer, Alexis was in for a busy day. It was one of the biggest sales days of the year and therefore it was a big money-making opportunity for her. When Alexis hadn't answered Tanya's calls that morning, that's what she put it down to. She thought she was busy creating content and making sales, but by midday, her social media was still dark, with her not posting to her feed or story at all. This wasn't like her on a normal day, let alone on one of the busiest days of the year. She also wasn't responding to messages in the group chat. This wasn't like Alexis at all. Her life was social media, 
so her phone was her life. Her friends were starting to worry, but these worries were appeased when Alexis texted the group chat at 5.30pm. She ignored the previous messages that had been sent all day and asked if anyone wanted to go out that night. It was the holiday, so no one could really meet up, but the group agreed to hang out the next day and have a chilled girls' night in. Little did they know that this text would be the last time they would hear from Alexis. When Alexis stopped responding to their messages, her friends immediately began to worry, and so too did Tom, Alexis' husband. Tom sent a text message to one of Alexis's friend's boyfriends, a man named John. He asked him if he had heard from her. Tom claimed that he and Alexis had gotten into a big argument. He said it resulted in Alexis hopping over the patio fence, jumping into a waiting car, and driving off with the occupants. John immediately called Tom, but something felt off. When explaining what had happened, Tom went over everything he had done that day, detailing things that didn't really matter instead of focusing on finding Alexis. The call lasted for 45 minutes and immediately after, John told his girlfriend that something was very wrong. Tom went on to call other friends of Alexis, telling them different stories about what had happened that night. To some, he claimed that Alexis and he didn't get into a fight. Rather, she had just got mad at him and stormed off out of the house barefoot. She then jumped into a small black car and drove off. But when asked how she would go off into the middle of the night without shoes, he then said it was possible that she was wearing shoes, but he just didn't notice. He claimed that Alexis had also left without her phone. But when he spoke to other people, he told them that he had tracked her using the Find My Phone application. By the next morning, he had called and spoken with multiple people, including Alexis's mum. He told very differing stories about what had happened. As Alexis's friends got up, they became increasingly worried. Tanya went over to Tom and Alexis' apartment but found that no one was there. Together with Alexis' mum, she filed a police report. Her friends immediately jumped into action, creating posters, hashtags and Instagram posts spreading awareness about Alexis being missing. On November the 28th, at around 8.30am, something caught the eye of a sanitation worker employed by the city. It looked like a mannequin abandoned at the side of the road. But something didn't sit right with him. He phoned his boss for help, saying that he wasn't sure what he was looking at. In reality, he was looking at the body of Alexis Sharkey. Her body was completely clean as if she'd been ended coming out of the shower or bath, and she was placed on the side of the road, posed in a degrading manner. Whoever took the life of Alexis wanted to treat her like garbage, like an object. They removed all clothes and left her in a very public road, just three miles from her apartment. She was there to be seen by as many people as possible, maybe people that she knew. This was no accident. This was personal. Despite the fact that her body had no visible injuries, her family and friends were certain that someone had done this to her. It was just a feeling, but it was correct. On January the 19th, 2021, over a month since Alexis passed, it was revealed that an autopsy ruled Alexis' cause of death was strangulation. Her passing was ruled as a homicide. It was also publicised that Tom was listed as Alexis' next of kin. He was the only person who her body could be released to, but he had left her body in the morgue for two months and never bothered to claim it. Just a note from me, I really hate this. Leaving someone alone cold and dark, even though it's just the physical form and not necessarily the person, it just really hits me. These aren't nice places. After Alexis was found, Tom had agreed with her mother that they should have a memorial service in Pennsylvania with her family. He said he would get the body and pay for a burial. That is, until he stopped speaking to the family full stop. Tom claimed that he felt disrespected by them. In response, he flat out refused to pick up Alexis's remains. This left the family powerless and unable to lay their beloved Alexis to rest. 
As the police delved deeper into Alexis and Tom's relationship, alarm bells began to ring. The relationship wasn't as picture perfect as it first appeared. Friends told the police that after a year of marriage, Alexis had wanted to get a divorce. She opened up about how Tom had been maltreating her, how he would throttle her until she passed out whenever they fought. She claimed that this had happened multiple times over the years, and despite Tom's promises to stop, the maltreatment had only gotten worse. Just a note from me, these people will never stop and they will never change. Almost without fail, their behaviour will get worse and worse and more extreme until we reach a situation like this. Be careful, make a plan and get out. Alexis also showed her friends the messages that Tom had been sending her while she was on a trip. In these messages, he had called her a derogatory term. He accused her of having affairs with other men and expressed his general hatred towards her. It was also revealed that Alexis had begun to flirt and talk with another man outside of their relationship. According to friends, Alexis had met this man whilst on a trip to Mexico. She wasn't planning on it, but they had simply hit it off. She told him that she was in the middle of a divorce. She didn't want to start anything before her marriage was ended. But he had been the friend who she went to bars with on Thanksgiving. Could this have been the catalyst for the events that led to her untimely end? Tom gave multiple interviews stating that Alexis wasn't the nice, happy person that people believed. But instead, she was dealing with a lot of personal demons. He claimed that she was stressed 24-7 and hated her life. He said that he was the only person that she could be herself around. Tom said that her friends and family didn't know the real Alexis, claiming that she had carefully crafted the perfect version of herself in front of others. Tom had been asked to give a sample of his DNA to the detectives on the case in order to rule him out. He agreed that he would give a small sample at the time, but before he did, he said he needed to talk to his lawyer. Instead, he moved to Georgia, the behaviour of an innocent man, obviously. Eventually, the police were able to track him down and arrange for them to meet, only for Tom to once again leave the state. He came up with a very bizarre story later on why he essentially disappeared, and then a short time after that incident, he relocated again to Florida. Progress on the case was slow as the police continued to pursue Tom. That was until September the 29th, 2021, when Houston police got an arrest warrant signed. They finally had enough to bring him in for the murder of his wife. Because of the high profile nature of the case, and because he had been evasive with the police throughout, they went very quietly about obtaining the arrest warrant. After determining that he was living in Florida with his daughter, they prepared to take him in. However, things wouldn't go as planned. Not by a long shot. The task force of US Marshals located Tom at the residence of his daughter in Fort Myers. They were able to make contact and establish that he was inside the residence. But when they announced their arrival, things took a turn. Tom wasn't ready to face the consequences of his actions. When he learned that law enforcement was there for him, he ran upstairs. Before police could do anything at all, he took his own life using a firearm. He passed on the scene. I would like to emphasize that this has been a very tragic series of events for both families, the Robinolds and the Sharkies. Uh, they've been through uh, hell, essentially, uh, with the attention of the public on this case. Uh, I want to put out there that no one else is suspected of any involvement in the case, and no one else is under investigation in the case. We have clear evidence that Mr. Sharkey acted alone. Because he ended himself before speaking to police, we'll never know the events that led to Alexis's passing. This case will likely be closed now that Tom Sharkey, the only suspect, is dead. Alexis deserved so much more out of life and Tom died as a coward, refusing to accept any responsibility. Mother Stacy has a different view. Loss of life is never good. But I do feel like, in a way, 
he did serve himself justice. What are your thoughts about this case? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons. Your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So, thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, Earl Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Sephiot Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebronek, Joy Burton, Dawn Croc, Michelle Mims, Natalie Lundquist, Anita Ford, and Darlene. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.